Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Watch. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I'll be showing you the first three rounds, and then I'll fast forward and show the last three rounds so that you can see the full arc of the game. Now, before we go into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoyed this video, then you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and gain access to some pretty cool perks, then please go to patreon.com slash John Gets Games. Uh, one of those perks involves watching opinions episodes where I I discuss all of my thoughts about all of the games that I'm playing recently. Now, before we go into the actual game, the last thing I'd like to ask is if while you're watching this, any part of it really jumps out to you, or maybe you see a turn where we probably should have done something differently, then please comment about that down below because I'd love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into the game. Now here we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles because I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Thematically, each one of us has just started working at the Soviet watch factory, and upon arriving, that we've discovered that this used to be a World War II era munitions factory. Now, we've been sent here to produce gears, which we can then sell for money, but we can also use those gears to then disguise the munitions crates that we are going to try to smuggle out as well. In addition to that, we can dig through the documents and files in the foreman's office in order to uncover evidence of government corruption during the aftermath of World War II, and we can use the monitoring infrastructure at the foreman's office to catch our co-workers misbehaving out here in the factory in order to exact bribes from them. Now, we do have to keep in mind that our opponents are also keeping watch, and they could exact bribes from us. Now, mechanically, the way the game works is each player has one worker, and beginning in the second round and moving forward, our workers will always be out here on the watch factory. Now, within each round, we are all going to start by picking up our worker and selecting a new location to go to. Once everyone has done this, we will then perform these actions starting at this watch hand, and we go clockwise around, having each player do the associated action, and then we can move on to the next round. Now, there is certainly more to it. Uh, as I mentioned before, before, we can keep watch on our opponents, and if you are in one of these dark areas, those are risky, and there's a possibility that you can be caught by the watch and then be forced to pay bribes. Now, after each player takes an action in one of these different quadrants of the board, they will then take a token from that associated quadrant, and they will place it onto one of the spots on the majority's board. So every single turn, you are going to perform an action and place one of these tokens down, and these tokens, when they cover up icons, will give you specific benefits. And at the end of the game, these are going to be majorities that we check, which will dictate the amount of victory points we get for the gears we have left, the money we have left, as well as the crates that we have taken throughout the game. Now, the crates also are worth points by themselves, so you could potentially get double points for those, and that makes sense considering the goal of this game is smuggling those munition crates out of the factory. Now, in addition to vying for majorities over here, another reason we want to take these tokens off is because these tracks are going to dictate the strength of the actions that we perform out here on the board, and the more tokens that we remove from that track, the stronger the action will be when we perform it. Once we've all performed our actions, this watch hand is going to move once clockwise, and then we can begin the next round of the game with all of us picking up our workers, and then once again selecting new locations to go to. Now the game always takes place over 12 rounds, and that means each player is going to take exactly 12 actions throughout the entire game. Once we finish those 12 rounds, it'll then be time for final scoring, and we can bring out this scoring track, and with this we can figure out how many points we've gained for doing a variety of things. We're going to get points for the crates we've taken, we also will get potentially points from our player board, we also might get points for set collecting with these document cards which you can play for special effects, but then also give you points depending on their color. We will also potentially get points for our gears and our our coins depending on how we vined for these majorities, and we also might get even more points from our crates depending on if we have majorities in those tracks as well. Lastly, we do lose 10 points for every debt token that we have, and we have to take these tokens whenever we need to pay bribes and we don't have the money for it, or we can optionally take them if we think that's a good idea. Bribes can be quite expensive to pay back, and obviously you don't want those at the end of the game, because losing 10 points for each of them is definitely a big problem. After we add all of this up, the player with the most points will be the winner. Now, this has been a very high-level overview, and don't worry, I will go into detail about how all of these things work while we are playing the game, and there are several different things that I didn't even mention in the overview that I will cover while we're playing. Well, at this point, I think we can now start playing the game, and for today's tutorial, we are going to play as the yellow player. 
So let's now start the first round of the game. Now every round is split into five overall phases that we perform in order, and the first phase is called place workers. Now the place workers phase for the first round is different from the second through twelfth round, so let's talk about how this first round placement works. Now we are the starting player for the game, and that means we are going to take our worker and we're going to place it onto one of the open action spots here on the board. There are eight different action locations, you can see them right over here, and you cannot go into a location that already has another worker. For our first turn, I think we're going to go over here to the smuggle area of the loading dock, and then in clockwise order, we can move on to the blue player who can put their worker down. Now, it's worth noting, this is the only time in the game that we're going to be going clockwise throughout the players, and for the rest of the game, these workers are going to be staying on the board. So again, I'll explain how the place worker phase works for the 2nd through 12th round later on in the tutorial. After considering their options, blue wants to go to the upgrade spot in the warehouse and red wants to go to the overtime location over here in the workshop. Now that everyone has placed a worker onto the board, we can move on. And the second phase of the round is called the reveal watch cards phase. Now we don't actually do this in the first round of the game, but we do it in the second through twelfth rounds, so I'll explain how that works once we get into the next round of the game. This means we skip from the first phase right over to the third. And in this third phase, we are going to carry out actions over here on the board. Now, the order in which we carry these out depends on the watch hand over here on the board. We start with the worker that is closest to the watch hand in a clockwise direction. And then after that player takes their turn, we continue going clockwise and we perform actions in that specific order. As you can see at the start of the game, the watch hand is pointing towards the 12, and we placed our worker right next to it. So we are the first worker in a clockwise direction. So that means we can now perform this action. So let's focus in more, and as you can see, this action area is called Smuggle. Now this lets us spend one or more gears in order to smuggle out munition crates through the loading dock. Now in order to figure out how many gears we spend and also what crates we get, we have to look over here at our player board. As you can see, it's split into four different rows, and the top row is specifically associated with that Smuggle action. Now this says we can spend one gear to take a light brown munitions crate, but if we look over here to the left, that rate is going to get better. For example, this right here says you could spend one gear to take two light brown, so obviously two crates is better than one for the cost of that one gear. Now we can perform any one of these that we have unlocked, and at the moment we haven't unlocked anything. That means this is our only option, so this is what we're going to do. We can spend one of our gears, and that will get us one light brown crate. And it's worth noting, you can't do this multiple times. You simply choose one of these options, you spend the associated number of gears, and then you can smuggle out the appropriate cargo crates. So we spent one gear, and now we can smuggle a light brown munitions crate. With that in mind, we can focus back over here to the loading dock, and as you can see, there are three different tiers of munitions crates. The bottom tier are light brown, middle is white, and the top tier is a dark brown, and remember, we are taking a light brown crate. Now, these are organized in stacks. Every single crate in this stack is a three-pointer, every one in that is two, and every one in that is one, and you obviously want to take the most points possible, so we're going to take this three-point crate. Every time you see a star like that, those are victory points that we're going to count up at the end of the game. Now it's important to note that each one of these stacks has a number of crates equal to the player count plus one, and once they're gone, they are gone. So there is a reason to try and get in here first and smuggle out as quickly as possible in order to gain those more lucrative crates. So we can take this crate and put it face up in front of us. Now at this point, our action would normally be done, but we all gained one of these document cards at the beginning of the game, and I think I'd like to use this one now. Now there are three different actions associated with the bottom of these cards, and there are four different colors of these cards, and during endgame scoring, we're going to gain extra points if we have at least one of each of these colors, and we also get extra points if we have a lot of specific colors. Now this right here says when we are smuggling, we can do another smuggle action depending on what type of cargo we've unlocked. If we have the ability to gain the white cargo from our track, then we could spend three gears right now to take another white. If we had the ability to get a dark brown from this track by being much farther down it, we could spend five gears right now to take a dark brown, but obviously neither of those are the case, but we do have access to the light brown and we also have one gear left. So I think let's just use this in order to smuggle one more time. Now I'm gonna put this sideways like that to show that we've used this card and it's only now relevant for endgame scoring. And the last thing I'd like to point out is you can only perform one of of these when smuggling cards with each one of your smuggle actions. So let's grab another light brown crate. That means we got six points in our first turn, although we are completely out of gears, and that's definitely something we can worry about in future rounds.
All right, we've now finished performing this action, but before we move on from our turn, we now have to do an upgrade. Now, specifically, we are going to take a token from our board that is associated with the quadrant of the board that we just activated. As you can see, there is a loading dock, workshop, warehouse, and foreman's office area, and we are in the loading dock quadrant. That means we are going to be removing the leftmost token from the loading dock row on our board, and we then have to place this into the leftmost spot on one of these six different majority tracks. Now, at the end of the game, the player who has the most tokens on a specific track is going to get the bigger benefit from that track. For example, the player who has the most tokens on this top track here will get two points for every one of the gears they have at the end of the game, whereas the player with the most tokens on this second track for the gears will get one point, and second most is going to get zero in this lower track, whereas second most gets one on the top. Now, these tracks right here will dictate how many points excess coins are worth at the end of the game, and the tracks down here might let you get even more points for the crates that you've taken. You can get quite a bit. Uh, the player who has the most tokens up here will get four extra points per crate, and then the second place gets one, and then down here, it's three points per crate, and second place gets one. Well, on our first turn, we took two crates, so that does put us in a crate lead for the moment, so I think let's put our token right over here to start vying to try and be the first or second place person in this row once the game is over to get extra points for the crates that we've already taken. Now, I do want to mention that there are some icons out here, and if by placing your token down you cover up one of these icons, you immediately gain the associated reward. That might be gears, it also might be coins, or it might be extra smuggling actions. When you cover these up, you spend the associated gears and do that smuggle action, although it's worth noting if you cover one of these up, but you have not upgraded to the point of being able to smuggle a white or dark brown crate, then you do not gain the benefit of covering up that bonus. Now, after we've placed that token, you'll notice that in the future, when we smuggle, we could spend one of our gears to take two of those light brown crates. And obviously, that's a much better ratio than this. And I imagine we'll be trying to smuggle again in the future. But of course, we need to get some gears before we come back to the smuggle action. After placing that token, our turn is officially over, and we simply lay the worker down to show that we are done. We can then move on to the next worker that's standing up in a clockwise order, and that is going to be red over here in the workshop. Now, specifically, they are on the overtime spot, and when you activate this, you gain a number of gears equal to the workshop level for that player's board. As you can see, the workshop level for the red player is currently at three gears. If this had been removed, then it would be at four. Now, this is their first turn, so nothing has been removed, and this means they are going to gain three gears. But then in addition to that, you'll notice that this action right here is dark brown, and this card in the middle has a dark brown section over here. Now what that means is whenever anybody performs the overtime action, they not only get these gears, but they gain extra gears that are printed on this card. In every one of the game's rounds, we're going to have a new card that comes out here, so these values are going to differ as the game goes on. But for right now, there is a three-gear spot there, so that means red is going to get three from their board, plus three from the market card, which means they are going to gain six gears total. Now, before we move on with the red player's turn, I'd like to talk a little bit more about this market card. Now, as you can see, the other quadrants are light in color, whereas this one is dark. And what that means is when a player performs the scrounge action, they will also gain the benefits of this light match. When everyone performs a watch action, this is going to dictate how that watch action works. And whenever anyone goes to the sell gears section, they will also gain any benefits that show up over here. This card is always oriented like this, so that the dark area matches up with over time and the watch icon right here matches up with the watch action on the board. So red has now taken a bunch of gears and in fact they are now up to eight. I do want to point out that the bronze gears are worth one, the silver are worth five, and the gold are worth ten gears. After performing overtime they now have to take a token off of the workshop spot of their board so they can remove this and then place that one onto one of these majority tracks and they're going to put it right up here. We're not too surprised to see that they're going on the gear spot considering they do have a bunch of gears although the game is still very early on and there's lots of ways to spend your gears. So just because red has a bunch right now does not mean they're going to have a bunch once the game is over. This also means that if in the future they perform a workshop action, they will get more gears than they got before. Now, actually, I'd like to point out that as we go down this track, once we get to the fourth and fifth spots, there are these victory points. Now, once you remove all of these, you still only gain gears equal to the leftmost gear icon showing. You don't gain these extra points, but during final scoring, if any of these are revealed, that will be the moment you gain these points. If, for example, both of these are gone, that would be 10 plus 5 or 15 bonus points for the red player. Obviously, that is a ways to go for the red player, but that's certainly something they can keep in mind as they continue to play. 
All right, red is done, so that means the blue player can now take their turn, and they are in the upgrade action spot. Now, this says they can spend their coins in order to upgrade an additional token off of their player board. The way this works is blue can select the leftmost token from any one of these rows and then spend a number of coins equal to the column of where that token was taken. After considering these options, blue wants to upgrade this token and it's above the one so they have to spend one of their coins. Now after that they're going to place this token onto one of the majority's tracks and after considering their options they're going to place right here. That means they are tied with us on this top row and during final scoring if there's a tie then all of the tied players get the associated benefit but any lower tiers like second place will not be performed. All right, Blue's upgrade action is done, and now they have to take a token from the warehouse part of their board and place that onto the majority's board. Now, we're not too surprised to see them go right over here, which puts them in the lead on this track, and it also covers up a one gear icon. That means they can take one gear from the supply as a bonus, and now they are done with their turn. All right, let's now focus back on the watch board. So far, we've been performing actions starting with the watch hand and going clockwise. And once all players have taken their actions, we will finish the phase unless we have not performed a watch action just yet. The watch action must always be performed whether or not a player put their token there. So we are going to continue going clockwise and then we can perform the watch action. Now, the first thing that happens for the watch action is we have to look over here to the market card and find the number associated with that icon. Now, this shows a two, and what that means is two out of these four different cards are going to be selected. As you can see on the back side of them, they are associated with the four different regions on the board, and specifically, they are associated with the risky actions in each one of those quadrants. Now, when no player goes here, we are going to randomly pull cards from the top until we reach the correct number, which in this case is two. These selected cards might have an impact on the next round, and I'll explain how that works once we reach the second phase. And I do want to mention that if a player activated the spot, then instead of choosing randomly, they would specifically choose the cards they wanted from the top of that deck, and they would take a number equal to the market value. So if blue was here, they would have chosen two out of these four cards instead of having us grab two randomly. Now I'll talk about the other player details for the watch action once a player activates this spot. Well, at this point, everyone has performed their actions and the mandatory watch action has happened, so that means the third phase of the round is over. Now we can move into the fourth phase, and this one is simple. We are going to move time by moving this watch hand one space over in a clockwise direction. After that, we can move into the fifth and final phase of the round, where we are going to draw a new market card and place it on top of the previous one. Remember, we have to orient this so that the watch icon is pointing towards the watch area and the dark background is pointing over here towards overtime. Now, as you can see, the values have changed on here, so the relative effect of the actions on the board are going to be different in the second round versus the first round that we already saw. Another thing I'd like to point out is the fact that there are exactly 12 of these market cards, so this also acts as a game clock. Once the last one of these cards is placed onto the board, then by definition, that is going to be the 12th round of the game, and the game will come to an end after that round. With the fifth phase done, that means the first round is done, and we can now move into the second round of the game. Now, the first phase involves placing workers, and as I mentioned before, it's a little bit different in the second through twelfth rounds versus the first round that we already saw. In that first round, we placed workers onto the board, but for the rest of the game, these workers will stay on the board, and now the way this works is we start with the watch hand, and we find the first worker that's lying down in the clockwise direction from it. In this case, that is the red player, and now red needs to move their worker to any other location that does not already have a worker on it. So they cannot choose overtime because they're there, and they can't choose upgrade or smuggle because both of those locations already have workers on them, but they have the other five options available to them. After considering these options, they've decided to head over here to the watch action, and then after that, we will continue going clockwise from the watch hand, and blue is the next to have a worker laying down. Now, they have decided they are going to head over to the foreman's office as well and go to the search files location, and then we can continue along, and finally, it's time for us to choose a spot. Now, the big thing that I'm keeping in mind is the fact that we currently have zero gears, so I think we should get some, and these three locations are good spots to gather gears. In particular, though, I think for this turn, let's head over to the produce gears action, and after we do that, we can see that all of the workers are standing up, which means the place workers phase has come to an end.
So after that, we can then move into the second phase where we are going to reveal the watch cards and potentially have players pay bribes. Remember, we skipped the second phase during the first round of the game, but we will use it for the second through 12th rounds. Now we can see the selected cards are right over here. They were placed randomly by the game because nobody activated this action in the first round. We can reveal these and then put them next to their associated quadrants. And then every player with a worker in the risky part of that specific quadrant is going to have to pay bribes. Once again, each quadrant has a risky option and a safe option, and in this round it looks like only the blue player took a risk. They figured they had a 50-50 chance of avoiding the bribe, but unfortunately that did not happen. The office was drawn, so that means they are caught and they must now pay the bribe. In order to do this, they first need to figure out how much of a bribe they need to pay. Now, the way this works is they can look at their player board and specifically find the column along the top for which they have the empty rightmost upgrade spot. As you can see, they have two empty spots in the first column and the rest are full. So that means this is their rightmost column and that is going to be the amount they have to pay as a bribe. So if they had upgraded differently on their previous turn and perhaps done something like this, then the second column would be their rightmost. And even though this is associated with the warehouse and they got caught in the office, that would still dictate the bribe amount and they would have to pay two of their coins instead of the one. Now you may be wondering what would happen if they did not have enough coins to actually pay this bribe. Well, that is where debt tokens come into play. Whenever you need to pay money and you don't have it, you're going to take debt tokens until you have enough money. And every time you take a debt token, you will also take five money instantly, which you can then use for whatever you need to spend the coins for. I'd also like to point out that you can optionally choose to take debt tokens when you're doing something like the upgrade action if you need more money than you have and you decide the debt token is worth it. Now, debt tokens can be a problem because once the game is over, you need to try and pay as many of these back as you can, and it costs eight money to pay a debt token back instead of the five money that it gave you. Now, for every debt token you can't pay off once the game is over, you will lose 10 victory points, so that is certainly something you need to keep in mind. Now, that's obviously not the case for the blue player, though. They had two money, and the bribe cost was just one, so they have to pay this bribe, and then this bribe will go towards whoever activated the watch action. In this case, we know that the game itself randomly drew those two cards, so that means Blue will pay the bribe over to the bank. But if a player had activated that action, then Blue would have to pay that bribe straight to the player. We can see the red player is planning on doing a watch action, so that means if somebody is caught in the next round of the game, then all of those bribes will be paid to the red player. After all bribes have been paid, that is going to bring the second phase to a close, and we can put these cards back on top of the stack. Now we can move into the third phase, and remember, this is where we are going to activate actions, starting with the player who is closest to the hand in a clockwise direction, and it looks like that's going to be us once again. In this case, we went to the Produce Gear spot, and as you can see, it shows a very similar icon to what we saw in Overtime, and that's because this works the same way. We will produce a number of gears equal to the value shown on our board, but this is not going to interact with the Market card. If we'd gone to the Overtime spot, we would have gained two additional gears, but you'll notice in addition to gaining these gears, we will also gain this effect right here, which I'll talk about very soon. Now let's start by taking those gears, and when we look to our board, that is going to be three. So we now have three gears over here. And then the next thing that we can do is this action. Now, the way this works is we can select any one of our tokens on a majority track and move it to the leftmost empty spot on that specific track and potentially gain any benefits that we cover up. So let's focus on the majority's tracks. And this is our only token, so that's the one we can move. Now let's go ahead and move it over to the leftmost empty spot. And as you can see, that's going to cover up a two gear location. So we are going to gain two gears from the supply. In addition to that, we now are going to take any one gear from the supply and we're going to place it on the spot where we were to show that that spot is no longer available for anybody to place into. The type of gear that we place here does not actually have an impact on the game. After that, we now have to place an upgrade token down onto a majority track, and we're going to take it from the workshop area. And we have a whole bunch of options to place this down onto once again. Now, I would like to point out that we cannot place these into any of these locations because those are only for a four-player game, and right now we're playing a three-player game. Now, part of me feels like we could go over there to once again be tied with a blue player, but I also feel like maybe we should just go down there in order to start vying for the second track as well, trying to split up our efforts. And I think that is what we're going to do. All right, that's finished our turn, and now it looks like the blue player can go, and they are going to perform a search files action. Now, the way this action works is the player will draw a number of documents from this pile and then keep less of those, but the number they draw and the number they keep are dictated by their player board. 
So let's focus on the player board, and in particular on the foreman's office row. Now, as you can see, the leftmost option shows three cards and one has a dark background. So this means that they would draw three cards and keep one of them. If they had upgraded this token away, they would draw four cards and keep one. After that, this would be five and keep one. And then once you get deeper on, you can actually keep more than one, all the way up to drawing six and keeping three of those if you have fully upgraded to the end of the row. Obviously, at this point, they haven't pulled any of these tokens off, so Blue will draw three cards and keep one of them. After deciding which documents they'll keep, the other ones are shuffled up and placed to the bottom of the deck. After that, Blue has to remove a token from the Foreman's Office section of their board, and then they've decided to place this right over here on the top Money Majorities track. Alright, Blue is done with their turn, and the next action in the clockwise order is going to be Watch. Remember, this always happens whether or not there's a player worker there, and in this case, the red player is there. So, instead of drawing random, which would happen with no worker, the red player now gets to decide which cards to go with. Now, there is a three over here, so that means three out of these four sections will be selected by the red player, and as a special bonus, the player who activates this spot can do a sneak peek at what the next market card will be, so they have a better idea of which of these actions might be more incentivized and where their opponents might go. After peeking at this, the red player is now going to choose three out of these four cards and then the cards that they select will go in front of them, and they will be the ones who reveal these during the second phase of the next round, and they are hoping to catch one or both of their opponents to try and get those bribes. Now, the red player is not done with the action because there are a couple more things that happen when a player activates this spot. The first of these is a bonus where they can now pay five money to pay back a debt token, and they can do this as many times as they want. Remember, at the end of the game, players have to spend eight money to pay back a debt token. So by paying it off here, you essentially spend the amount of money that the debt token gave you. At the moment, the red player does not have any debt tokens, so they aren't going to use this. But of course, this does make a lot of sense to do if you do have debt tokens that can be repaid now. The final thing to happen is the player who activated the spot will take this black token. Now it starts the game over here on the board, and the red player is going to take this, and it will then stay in players' areas for the rest of the game. In the future, if another player goes here, then they will take this black token away from the red player, and then it will go onto the player board of the person who went to the spot. Now this is important, because if a player gets caught while they have the black token, the bank is going to pay the bribe instead of that player having to pay the bribe. So red can place this right over here on their board, and once again, for the rest of the game, this token is simply going to be passed back and forth between the players as they take this action. All right, that's finished the action part, and now red needs to pull a token off of the foreman's office part of their board, and then they'll place this onto a majority track. After considering the options, they are going to go onto the gear spot again, but they're going to go onto the bottom track, trying to vie for both of these, because if you are first in both, then that would make each one of your gears worth three points each at the end of the game. Well, red is done with their turn, and now everyone has taken their actions, and we have also had the mandatory watch action. This means the third phase is done, and the fourth phase is simple. We'll just move the clock hand over, and then for the fifth phase, we can reveal this market card, which the red player already took a peek at. After that, we can now start the third round of the game, and we begin with placement. In this case, it looks like the blue player gets to place first, and they've decided to smuggle. After that, the red player can choose, and they are going to upgrade... And finally, we can place. Now, if we were to go to search files or to overtime, then we would be risking running into one of these and we'd have to pay the red player a bribe. And honestly, we have a bunch of gears right now and I don't feel a desperate need to get more documents. So I think instead, let's head over here to the loading dock and in particular, go to the sell gears action. All right, we're done with placement, so now we can move into the reveal watch cards phase. The red player reveals all three of these, and it looks like they are watching the loading dock, the workshop, as well as the warehouse. Now, in this case, the blue player has been caught once again. This is two rounds in a row that they have been caught by a watch card. And in this case, they now have to pay the bribe to the red player, since red is the one who chose these cards. So once again, the blue player looks over here to find the rightmost column with an empty spot, and it looks like that is still one. So they are going to pay one money and a bribe, but they've actually decided they're going to reveal one of these document cards. There are three of these effects, and so far we've seen the smuggling effect, and the next one is this. It says, when caught, the bank pays your bribe instead of you having to pay the bribe from your own supply. So in this case, that means blue gets to keep their money, and then the bank is going to pay that bribe over to the red player. Now, I do want to point out that the red player is within one of the spots that matches up with one of these cards, but when you watch yourself, nothing actually happens. 
So that's going to finish the watch phase, and now it's time to perform actions. It looks like the first player to take an action is going to be Red. Now they are upgrading, and they've decided to upgrade this token off of their board. That is going to cost them one money, and we haven't actually talked about this row just yet, because this is associated with an action we haven't talked about. Now, this shows a gear amount and a coin amount underneath it that increases as you go until you hit these endgame victory point spots. And this row is connected with the scrounge action over here in the warehouse. Every time someone activates this, they will gain a number of gears and coins equal to the rightmost spot that shows gears and coins. Once again, if you have revealed these victory points, then you will just get those points at the end of the game. So the best this can get to is three gears and three coins. Now, in addition to gaining these gears and coins, a player who goes to the scrounge spot will also gain everything that's in this box here. As you can see in this round, that would be one coin. In the last round, that was two gears. And in the first round of the game, if someone went there, they would have gained an extra gear and an extra coin. So that's how Scrounge works, but of course right now the red player is in the middle of their upgrade, and they have to place this token down onto one of these majority tracks. After considering their options, they want to place it right here. Once again, you must go into the leftmost empty spot in the row that you've selected. After placing that down, Red has decided they would like to reveal a document card. Again, there are three different effects on these, and we've seen two of them so far, and this is the third and final type. This says they can move one of their tokens on the majority tracks. Now, this means they can take any one of their tokens and move it to the leftmost empty spot on any track. That could be the track they move from, or it could be any other track. In this case, they've decided to move this token from this track and head over here, and whenever you move a token, you take a gear of any type from the supply, and you put it where the token was removed from. Now by placing this right here, they've covered up one gear, so that means they will gain a gear as a bonus from the supply. And that's finished their upgrade action. Now they have to pull a token from the warehouse row on their board and place that onto a majority track. And they've decided to place this right over here. So that means over the course of this turn, the red player went from zero tokens in this row to three. So they are certainly in the majority at this moment. And in addition to gaining that gear already, they now get this effect. That says they can spend one gear to smuggle one light brown cargo. So they'll spend one gear and then take the highest value light brown cargo, which is a three-pointer. Now, the blue player is pretty unhappy to see that because they are about to smuggle, and they were planning on taking both of these threes. There is just one three left, so it looks like the blue player is going to be taking a three and a two-pointer. So by the red player sneaking in and doing this bonus smuggle action, they've actually gained a point on the blue player. Well, red is done with their turn, so now the blue player can go, and they are going to smuggle. When we look at their board, we can see the rightmost open spot for the loading dock row says they can spend one of their gears in order to smuggle two light brown cargo boxes. So they will take the highest value one, and then the next one up is going to be a two value. So they are getting five points worth of cargo boxes this turn. And remember, these boxes could potentially be worth more points at the end of the game, depending on how that player competes on the cargo majority tracks. After taking these, the blue player is done smuggling, and now they can remove a token from their loading dock. That is going to be this one here, and this means in the future when they smuggle, they will spend two gears to take a light brown cargo as well as a white cargo. And remember, those range from four, five, to six points, and of course you take the highest value possible. So they're probably hoping to do that relatively soon to start getting into those six-point white ammo boxes. Next up, blue has to place this token onto one of the majority tracks. And they've decided to go right up here. All right, blue is done with their turn, and that means we can go, and it's time to perform the first sell gears action of the game. Now, the first thing that we can do is sell any number of our gears and gain one coin for each one of those sold. Currently, we have five gears and three money, and I think let's spend three of our gears to get a bunch of money so that we really don't have to worry about it for a while. We're leaving two gears behind because I am planning on smuggling in the next round, and in that next round, this will be gone, and we could spend these two gears to take the one light brown and one white cargo box from the loading dock. So we spent three gears, and now we gained three coins, and that's going to leave us with six coins total. After that, there is one more effect over here at the Cell Gears area, and it says that once, we can upgrade one of the cargo boxes that we have already taken. A light brown can turn into a white, and a white can turn into a dark brown box. Currently, these are our cargo boxes, so let's trade this one. And we do that by returning it to the supply, and then we can take any from the next type. So obviously, we will take the six-point white cargo. Now, that does mean that somebody else can take this in the future, and it also means if we had a one-value light brown, we could have returned that to then upgrade into any of these. So in this case, we just gained three points, but it's possible in the future you could gain even more than three by doing this upgrade. 
So we could place this right over here. And then lastly, we will gain an amount of coins equal to this icon here on the market card. This is always going to be extra coins, and in this case, that's two. So that means we have gained two more coins, bringing us up to eight. And I think we're pretty good on coins for a while. Okay, we're done selling gears, so now we can remove a token from the loading dock row, and that will unlock this new smuggling option for us in the future. Now we have to place this onto one of the majorities, and currently we have a whole bunch of coins. Uh, now, there are ways to spend it for sure, but I think we should maybe start thinking about investing in these coin rows. And in particular, let's go down to the bottom, considering the red player already has three up here, and no one is down here on the bottom. The first place player on the bottom gets two points per coin, and first place on the top gets three, so obviously the top is better, but I think this is still probably a good call for us. I suppose we could go up there and gain another coin, but for now, I think this is probably a better pick. All right, we are done with our action, and I just realized that I made a slight mistake earlier. Before we took our action and before the blue player went, technically the game should have activated the watch action. Now, when this happens, it would have just randomly taken one card, so this wouldn't actually have affected any of the effects that we did. So this one card should be right there, and technically that should have happened before blue went and before we went. Sorry about that. All right, all of the actions have now been taken, which means we can move into the fourth phase. This one simply moves the time forward once, and then for the fifth phase, we can take the next market card and place that out onto the board. All right, we are now ready for the fourth round of the game, but before we move on, I'd like to talk a little bit more about what happens once the game is over. Now again, that happens once we complete 12 full rounds, and then before we move into final scoring, every player is going to get one bonus smuggle action. Now this will happen in order from the watch hand and going clockwise around, and when you perform this special smuggle action at the end of the game, you do not remove a token from your board to place it onto the majority's tracks. What this means is in the 12th round of the game, you can set yourself up with enough gears to do a big smuggle action right there before endgame scoring starts. After that, we will bring out the scoring mat and then use our workers in order to track the points that we are gaining. Now, as you can see, we will get points for seven different things. And the first thing we'll get points for is crates. This is simple. We just add up all of the star points on the crates that we have. For example, right now we would have nine points and over here, the blue player has five. We would simply log that by moving our token down on this track, and then the next thing we'd get points for would be our player boards. As I have mentioned before, the fourth and fifth spots in the middle two rows have victory points on them. Now, if you remove the token, you get those points, so if it looked like this at the end of the game, that would be 10 plus 5 plus 5, or 20 points for our player board. Next up, we will all score set collection with the document cards that we've collected. Now for this, we simply reveal all of the cards that we have in front of us that we maybe haven't shown just yet, and then we will score for their different colors. For each of the colors, you will potentially get points. You get zero points for the first, five for the second, 10 for the third, and then 20, 30, 40, etc. for every card after that. So once again, the first card is nothing, the second and third cards add 5 points, and every card after adds 10. Now that is for each of the colors, and then after scoring those points for the sets of colors, every player who has at least one card in all four colors will get a bonus 25 points. After that, it will then be time to score for the gear, coin, and crate bonuses that we get from the majority tracks. Now, I have discussed some of this before, but now is a good time to go through all of it in detail. We begin with the top, and the player who has the most tokens in this row is going to get two points for every gear they have left over at the end of the game, and a player with the second most tokens in this row will get one point per gear. If there is a tie for first, then all of the tied players get two points per gear, and no one gets points for second place, and if there's a tie for second place, then all second place players get one point per gear. Looking down, we can see in the second row, it's a little bit worse. The first place player gets one point per gear, and second place gets zero, so only the first place matters down here. Now, I do want to point out that you get a maximum of 60 points for this multiplier with your gears, so you want to make sure that you don't have more gears than you'll actually be able to score points for. We can move on down here to the coins, and this works in the exact same way. You can see the scoring modifier for the coins you have at the end of the game is a little bit different, though. So the first place player in this row would get three points per coin they have at the end of the game, and second place would get one. Once again, there is a maximum score of 60 for the coin multiplier. Finally, we can score bonuses for crates, and these give the most points of anything, which again makes sense because this game is all about smuggling those munition crates out of this watch factory. We can see the player with the most tokens up here will get four points per crate that they have, and the second most will get one, and down below it is three and one, and there is no maximum, so you can get a bunch of points by scoring for this crate majority. 
After that, it's finally time to score debts. However, it's worth noting that before we do any of this, you first have to pay off your debts. I mentioned this before, but it's going to cost you eight money per debt token that you pay back to the bank. And again, that happens before you score anything. Once you get down to the debt level, you will then lose 10 points for every debt token that you still have. So once again, you actually have to spend those coins before you potentially score points for the coins that you have remaining. After that, the player who has the most points will be the winner. All right, it's now time for the fourth round of the game, but I think what I'm going to do now is actually fast forward through several rounds, and then we can pick things up near the end of the game and then see who actually wins this one. All right, here we are at the start of the 10th round of the game, so we just fast forward through six rounds. Now, a whole bunch of things have happened. As you can see, our boards uh, have quite a few empty spots on them. There have been some big bribes going back and forth, and it's worth noting that this majority track is now locked. Once again, you can only place on these spots in a four-player game, and the blue player was able to be sneaky and put tokens on both of these spots on their last turn, so that has locked them in for first place in this row, and we are locked in for second. So we know we are going to get one extra point for every one of our cargo, while blue is going to get four extra points for each of theirs. Now that might seem like a bummer, but we're doing pretty good as well because we have three of these dark brown nine pointers. We picked up two of them on our last turn, but when we did that, we did not actually have any more tokens to place. So if we smuggle in the future, we can continue to turn in gears at a great rate, but we won't put any more majority tokens down. So that's certainly something that we have to keep in mind. And of course, this is the 10th round, so there's only three rounds left, which means each of us will only be taking three more actions before the game is over. So let's start the placement phase of this 10th round, and the blue player gets to go first. They have decided they're going to head over to the foreman's office to search some vials, and then the red player has decided they're simply going to scrounge. After that, we can move, and we currently have no gears in front of us because we just spent a bunch of them on a smuggle action in the last round. With that in mind, I think let's try to get as many gears as we can. And one way to do that, I think, is going to be to go to produce goods. We could go to overtime and get two more than this. But produce goods will let us move a token, and currently there's a 3 gear and 5 gear bonus spot available, so I'm hoping to hit both of those and get 8 bonus gears in addition to the standard gears that we get for this. Alright, we've all moved, so now it's time to reveal the cards that were randomly picked in the last round. It looks like in the last round and none of the players picked this action. Those spots are going to be the warehouse and the foreman's office. Now that's not great for the blue player, as you can see they are in the risky spot for that quadrant and their bribe amount has gotten quite high, it's currently at 5 coins. They only have 2 coins, so in order to do this they either need to take a debt token, or they can play a card, and they have drawn a couple of these, and they are indeed going to play this. Uh, they've already played one that lets them have the bank pay the bribe, and it looks like they got another one of these, so they are going to play this one, and instead of them paying 5 coins, the bank will. Obviously nothing happens here because it's the bank paying the bank, because none of the players have picked the watch. Well, we can now start performing actions, and we get to go first. Now, on this spot, we're going to make it gears according to our workshop level, and that's currently at 5. So we can take 5 gears, and then we can perform this effect. That says that we can take any one of our tokens and move it to the leftmost open spot in that specific row. So let's take this one and move it here. We're going to put a gear on the spot that we vacated, and then we will gain 3 gears for covering that location. After that, we now can remove a token from the workshop row, and I think we should certainly place it right over there. That is going to get us five more gears as a bonus, and that means we now have four of our tokens in this row compared to three of the green player. Since we are now stuck in second place over here, getting one point bonus for each of our cargo, it makes, I think, a lot of sense for us to push to get first place in the second row, where we get three points for each, which is certainly less than four, but definitely a good thing to still go for. All right, that's finished our turn, so now the red player can go, and they are going to gain one bonus gear, as well as the gears and coins from their warehouse. They are currently at the three and three mark, so they will get three money and then four gears, because again, one of those comes from the market card in the middle of the board. After that, they're going to place this token onto the majority's board. And they've decided to go here, which means they are continuing to fight us to try and dominate this row. They have four, and we have four, so it's pretty precarious. Uh, whichever one of us gets to place here first is going to take first place, and the other person is going to take second. I suppose the blue player could come in here, but I think that's pretty unlikely to happen. Well, red is done, so now the blue player can go, and they are going to be searching some files. When we look at their board, their level says they get to draw five cards and then keep one of them. And they've decided to take this one here. They now have two hidden cards and two cards that they played. 
After that, the other ones can be shuffled up and placed to the bottom of the deck, and then Blue gets to take a token from their foreman's office, and they'll place that somewhere on the majority's board. After thinking it through, they're going to go right over here. All right, blue is done, and now the mandatory watch action happens. Nobody selected this action, though, so it looks like we are going to randomly pull two of these, and those will be triggered in the next round. All right, that's all the actions done, so now we can move this forward and then draw the second-to-last market card. After that, it's now the 11th round of the game, and this is the second-to-last round. Now, the red player gets to go first, and it looks like they were thinking ahead because they are now going to go all the way around here and go onto the upgrade spot. That means they are going to be the first one to activate, which means they've managed to find a way to sneak in and place a token here before we will be able to. So maybe my creative play to put both of these down on the last turn wasn't such a good idea. It looks like we may have set the red player up to snag that first place away from us. All right, it's now time for the blue player to move, and they are considering going to the smuggle action, but they've decided it's actually going to be better for them to scrounge. Now, after that, we can place, and considering blue left smuggle open, I think it's going to make sense for us to go there. Remember, everyone gets a free smuggle action once we finish the 12th round of the game, so that's probably why the blue player skipped up on it. They figure they would rather just lean into that final smuggle action instead of doing one now and maybe not having enough gears to do an effective one later on. Now, as far as we're concerned, we've got a bunch of gears right now, and I think we could smuggle now and smuggle at the end of the game and get a bunch of points for that. Another thing to keep in mind is the fact that for the blue player right now, every gear that they have is worth three points at the end of the game. And for us, every gear that we have is worth nothing. <laughs> so it makes more sense for us to liquidate gears and the blue player might not actually end up spending their gears. Those gears might end up being more lucrative than the ammunitions cargo. Of course, at the end of the game, the blue player might not get three points per gear. It's going to depend on how these majority tracks change for the last couple rounds of the game. Well, we've all finished our placement, so now it's time to reveal the watch cards. These were picked randomly by the game since no one selected this action, and it looks like the workshop is being watched and the loading dock as well. Now, no one's over here in the overtime spot, but we are on the risky spot for the loading dock. And when we look down at our board, our bribe amount would be 7. Now, I say would be because, fortunately for us, we were the last player to take a watch action. We did this a few rounds ago, and this means the bank is going to pay our bribe instead of us. So having this is a really nice way to not be worried about going to those more powerful risky spots. Having this token is a big reason why you might want to take that watch action, and I feel like our opponents have maybe lost more money to bribes than they would have liked and are regretting not doing more watch actions themselves. Either way, we can now have the bank pay our 7 money bribe, and it's going to go right back to the bank because no player selected that watch action last round. Alright, it's now time for us to start taking actions, and the red player will begin over here, and they can do an upgrade. Now, if they're being honest, the main reason red went to that upgrade spot was so that they would be the first player to act in this round so that they could lock in that majority for getting more points for their cargo. They didn't really go there because of that upgrade action. Now, performing actions from the main board is completely optional. Normally, it makes sense to do that, but in this case, the red player has to decide if it does make sense to spend that money to do this upgrade. Right now, red is set up to get quite a bit of points for their money at the end of the game, but they've decided it does still make sense for them to spend three of their money to upgrade this token off. So, they can spend the three money, and then they've decided to remove this token and place it onto the majority's board. Now, once again, the main reason they took this action was so that they could lock this in, so they're going to take care of that right now. This means Red has five of their tokens here, getting them first place and three points per cargo at the end of the game, and we have four tokens, so we get second. So despite the fact that we have put way more tokens in this whole area compared to both of our opponents, each of them are getting more points per cargo box than we are. Blue has five tokens down, and they're getting four points each. Red has five, and they're getting three. And we have seven tokens down, and we're only getting two points per cargo. So that investment of tokens did not work out very well for us. Next up, Red can remove a token from their warehouse, and that's actually their final token from the warehouse row. And then they can place this down onto a majority row. After considering their options, they're going to place right up here. All right, Red is done, so now Blue can scrounge. That is going to get them two extra gears, plus the gears and coins from their board. And they are at the three gear and three money spot. So they'll gain three money as well as five gears, because again, they get two from that market card in the middle of the board. After that, they're going to remove their final token from the warehouse row and place that onto the majority's board. And they've decided to wrestle first place on this top row back away from red. It was a friendly tie, but now blue is in the lead, and they also get two extra money for doing that. 
Well, blue is done, so now we can do our smuggle action. Now, when we smuggle, we can choose any of the options available to us. We don't have to go with the most expensive one. And it looks like this is the second time in the game where we're not going to be placing a token down onto a majority track because we are smuggling while having no tokens to put. So hopefully this will be worth it to us. We are investing a lot of our effort into getting more of these cargo boxes, and we are slipping more and more behind on those majority tracks. Either way, we currently have 13 gears available to us, so I think let's spend seven of them in order to take two more of the dark brown cargo boxes. That means we're going to gain a 9-pointer and an 8-pointer, so we just spent 7 gears and got 17 points worth of cargo. Now technically, we are going to be in second place for both of these majority scorings, so that means each cargo box is worth an extra 2 points, so we actually got 21 points total on this turn. We didn't even have to spend points to get it, because right now we aren't getting any points for any excess gears at the end of the game. After that, we don't put a majority token down because, once again, this row is empty, and I'm hoping that is not going to bite us, although we do have way more munitions than the rest of our opponents, and our munitions are of much higher quality. Either way, that is going to bring our turn to a close. Oops, before we took our smuggle action, technically the game should have performed a watch action, so that means three random cards should have been placed down, and that is quite a few overall. So it's pretty risky in the next round for everybody who does not have this black token. Remember, we have that black token, so we don't feel that risk. Now, after the watch happens, then we would have done our smuggle, but of course we've already jumped ahead for that. So now we can move on, and the watch hand is going to move forward for the last time in the game. After that, we can reveal the final market card and place it right over here, and now we can move into the final round of the game. We know it's the final round again because there are no market cards left to be placed on the stack later. Now once again, once we finish this round, everyone can optionally perform one more smuggle action, and we'll do it in order from the watch hand over. So that means if a player goes right here, then they would be the first player to do that bonus smuggle action, which happens right before final scoring. All right, it's now time to place our workers, and I feel like the best thing for us to do would be to go over here to the workshop. In particular, we don't need the extra gears, even though we're not worried about the riskiness of this since we have the black token. I think I would rather go here to potentially get some use out of moving one of our tokens over. Part of me wanted to go here in order to sell our gears into money, considering right now our gears are worth nothing and our money is worth one point each, and we could also do an upgrade. But remember, at the loading dock, we've already put all of our tokens down, whereas if we go to the workshop, we can place a token onto the majority board, and in fact, by doing that, we will unlock five points from our board as well. So this means we're going to end with a bunch of gears that we're not going to get points for, but I think this is still the best call for us. Next up, the red player can move, and they've decided they would like to liquidate a bunch of their gears. For the red player, currently money is worth a lot more points than gears, and they also are looking forward to doing an upgrade. Finally, the blue player can move, and they are going to search files for their last action. That is a little bit risky, considering there are three cards right here, but they've decided to go for it. Now we can reveal these cards, and it looks like, yep, they did indeed get hit. Now the rest of us went for the non-risky spots, but the blue player is indeed going to have to pay that bribe. Currently, blue has two of these face-down cards, but unfortunately for them, neither of them pay bribes. They've already played two cards that would pay bribes to the bank, but in this case, they don't have any more in their hand. Now they can look at their board, and they have cleared this final spot, so the bribe is going to cost them seven money, and they have exactly seven money. If they had even one less money, then they would have been forced to take a debt token. Now they're still not happy about this. Currently they are getting two points per money at the end of the game, and it seems very likely they'll get at least one money per money at the end of the game, so that is certainly costing them some points. They're hoping this action makes up for it though, and now they can perform it. Now this lets them search for files. And when we look at their board, they can draw five cards and then keep two of them. As you can see, if you get all the way to the end, you can draw six cards and keep three. So if you really invest in this track, you can get a ton of cards with those nice actions on them and potentially get a bunch of points for them at the end of the game. As it stands, the blue player is still probably going to get a decent number of points from these cards. So blue can draw five of these, and once again, they get to keep three of them. These are the ones they're going to keep, so the other three will be shuffled up and placed to the bottom of the deck. Next up, Blue wants to play one of their four document cards, and this one says they can move a token on the majority tracks. 
Now you can only play one of this type of card per turn, and the blue player is a little bummed by that because they have more than one of these in their hand. Either way, this lets them move any token to the leftmost spot of any track, and currently they are getting no points for this track. They have one token compared to the two of both of their opponents, and if there is a tie for first, then no one gets second. Of course, blue could put a token over here to fight for that, but at the moment they have no money, so they've decided the better thing for them to do is to move this token right over here. That is going to get them three money, which they will potentially be getting uh, one point for at the end of the game if they continue to be in second place here. And then, of course, we do have to block this off with any type of gear. After that, Blue can remove a token from the foreman's office part of their board, and they've decided to put this one well, right over here. That puts them at three compared to the one of both of their opponents, and it looks like they want to make it pretty much impossible for anyone to get any points from that second row. By doing that, they are, I suppose, inviting somebody to get three coins, but they think this is still worth it. All right, Blue is finished with their final action of the game, and now we have the watch action. No one is here, so a random card will be drawn, although this card will never actually be revealed, so it's not actually necessary. Now, a reason somebody might have gone here would have been to pay back as many debts as they could at a 5 to 1 rate instead of the 8 to 1 rate that people will be forced to pay them back later. But so far in this game, it looks like all of us have just barely managed to avoid taking any debt tokens. All right, it's now time for Red to take their turn, and they can sell as many cogs as they want for one coin each. After thinking this through, they are going to spend 8 out of their 10 cogs, and that is going to get them 8 money. Now, the reason they didn't spend all 10 is because they now have 12 money total, and they are hoping to have a 5-point modifier for each one of these at the end of the game. 12 times 5 is 60 points, and 60 is the maximum you can score for coins on that majority track, so they figured they may as well save these gears to get points from the majority track, or to smuggle with them in the bonus smuggle action we do before final scoring. Now the second part to the selling gears action lets the red player upgrade one of their cargo, and they do have a one point light brown box. So they are going to upgrade this into any of the white boxes that are currently in the supply. And fortunately for them, there is a single six over here, so that is effectively a five point swing for them. Next up, red can remove a token from the loading dock row of their board. And they could go over here to get three coins, although they don't actually need coins considering they are at the max. Instead, they would like to ensure that they'll get these two points for being in first place down here by going onto that spot. If they didn't do that and then we placed right over here, then we would be in first place and they would be in second and they would lose one point for every coin they have. And currently they have 12 coins. So this seems like a really good move for them, although that does invite someone else to go here and spend one cog in order to gain one more white cargo box. All right, red is done, so that means we can go and we are going to produce gears according to our board and then we can move one of our majority tokens. First things first, let's take cogs, and as you can see, that is on the 6 mark. So we can take 6 cogs from the bank, and then we can move one of our tokens. Now as far as I can tell, we have two good options. We can move this up here and get 3 coins, and then later on this turn, we could put a token right over here to tie for first. That way we'd get 2 points per coin, and that means these 3 coins would be 6 points for us. The other option that I'm seeing is we could move one of these over here in order to perform this, and I think in either circumstance we are going to do this, but then if we did that, we could place here with a token from our workshop, and that would once again have us tying for first, which is good because we still have coins, and we'd get to perform this, which would let us spend three of our gears to take one of the dark brown boxes. Now the best one of those is currently worth eight points, and as of this moment, we are getting no points for our gears, and I think we're going to have excess gears. So I think this is probably the better plan. So let's go ahead and move either one of these. We'll move that one here. We can put any type of cog on that spot, and then we can spend one cog in order to take the best white cargo box. Currently, that is a five, and we have a lot of cogs in front of us. So let's go ahead and spend it. And then let's remove a token from our workshop. When we do that, that is going to unlock five points at the end of the game, which is great. And then we can put this token right over here. That means we are going to be tying for first for our coins that we have. And we can now spend three of our gears to take a dark brown box. Remember, you can only gain this benefit if you have the ability to smuggle into that type of box already on your board. And we cleared that row off quite a while ago. So let's grab that eight point dark brown box. And of course, this is actually worth 10 points to us because we are in second place for both of these majority tracks, adding plus one to each of these at the end of the game. 
Well, our turn is done, and we've just finished the third phase of the round, and since this is the final round of the game, we actually just stop here. There's no reason to go into the fourth or fifth phases. So, that means the game is now over, and before we move into final scoring, everyone is going to get one bonus smuggle action, and when they do this action, they're not going to place a token onto this board. However, they can play a bonus smuggle card from their hand if they happen to have one. Now, we're going to do this in player order, starting with the hand of the watch, so that means the blue player can do this smuggle action first. At the moment they have 14 gears and they could spend five of those to take a dark brown cargo box and a white box and remember each cargo box they take is worth four extra points because they are in the lead on the top box majority track. If they did this they would get an eight pointer and a five pointer so that is 13 points there plus another eight for getting two of these four point bonuses. So, all told, that would be 21 points. Now, they have to spend five of their cogs, and they are in first place in both of these tracks. So, that means they're getting three points per cog at the end of the game. So, they are effectively spending 15 points worth of cogs to get 21 points, and that does net them six points, so they are going to do this. So, they will pay those five gears and take both of these cargo boxes. Now, they could play a smuggling card from their hand. Remember, those look like this, which let you spend one, three, or five gears in order to take a light brown, white, or dark brown box. I'll tell you right now that blue has at least one of those in their hand, but considering they get three points per gear at the end of the game, they have decided it's not actually worth playing that card. All right, blue is done with the bonus smuggle action, so now red can do it. And for them, every gear they have at the end of the game is worth one point, but they've decided it does still make sense for them to spend two of their gears in order to get a white cargo box and a light brown box. This means red is going to end the game with no gears, which means their investment on both of these tracks seems a little bit wrong, but of course they didn't know that was how things were going to shake out while they were playing the game. So they can go ahead and take the white and light brown box. As you can see, that is going to be five points total, but then they are winning the majority for this bottom track, so that is plus three, plus three. So overall, this is 11 points for those two gears, and that's certainly better than the two points they would have gotten for coming in second place for this row. So, red is done, and we can now perform our bonus smuggle action. And we currently have eight gears that are worth zero points to us at the end of the game, so let's spend seven of these for sure in order to take two more dark brown boxes. There's one eight-pointer left, so we can grab that, and then one of these sevens. Well, the smuggle actions are done, so it's now time for final scoring. In order to do this, we can remove our player markers, we can simply slide this board away, and then we can bring out the scoring track. Now, before we actually score, every player has to repay all of their debts. Remember, each debt that you repay costs you eight money, and you must spend this. If you have the eight money, you are not allowed to save that debt and keep the money. Now, in this case, though, it seems all of us were able to avoid taking debt, a couple of us just barely, so none of us has to spend eight coins in order to put this debt back. After that, we can now start scoring, and we'll begin by scoring the points on our crates. I figured we'll go left to right, so we can start over here with blue. Now it looks like they have 28 points worth of cargo over here, so we can track that on the board. Next up, we can score our massive munitions cargo haul. We were certainly the best at getting cargo out, and we also got the highest value cargo. This is 84 points right here, and the way we can show that is by taking one of these tokens that does not actually matter for final scoring, and we can put that on the 50 spot, and then we can put our token onto 34. Finally, we have the red player, and they have 32 points worth of cargo over here. So we'll put their token here, and as of this moment, we are blowing our opponents away, but we have also scored the majority of the points we're going to get in this game, as you'll see. Now, the next thing we'll score for is the player board, which are going to be the spots that we've unlocked that show points on each of our boards. Blue unlocked a 5 and a 10, so that is 15 points for them. So that'll bring them from 28 up to 43. We were able to clear 5 points, so that will bring us from 84 up to 89. And the red player was able to clear 5 plus 10, or 15 points, so that brings them from 32 up to 47. Next up, we can score set collection. Now, these are for the documents that we have played, as well as the ones that we have in our hand. And this is something that we literally never did the entire game. We have just the card that we started with, and you get zero points for having one card in a suit, so we get no points for this. We can look over here to the red player, and they put two cards down, but they're different colors. So they have two sets of one, which means they're going to get zero points as well. It appears they were thinking about trying to go for one of each color, but then they changed their decisions and they never actually got back to it. So red gets no points as well, but then over here, the blue player has six cards. 
Now, the first thing that we can see are sets. They have three of these light brown cards. Remember, if you have one, that's zero points. If you have two, it's five. And if you have three, that is 10. If you have four, then it's going to jump up to 20. So if they had had one more, they would have really started to get more points. But still, this is getting 10 points, which they're happy about. Now, after that, they also get 25 points if they have at least one of each of the four colors, and they do. So that means they are going to get 25 points plus 10, which will be 35 points for their set collection. Blue was at 43, so when they add 35 to that, they now go up to 78. And now we can score for the gears, coins, and crate bonuses on the majority tracks. Let's start with gears. On the top row, blue has five tokens compared to red's three. So blue is in first, and they will get two points per gear, and red will get one. And then down here, blue has three to the one of each of the rest of us. So blue is in first place again, and they will get one more point per gear. So that means blue gets three points per gear, red gets one point per gear, and we get no points per gear. Well, blue ended the game with nine gears over here. So that is going to be nine times three, or 27 more points. That's going to bring them all the way up to 105. We have one gear, but remember it's worth zero points to us, and the red player has no gears left in front of them. After that, we can score coins. Red is in first place up here, so they're going to get three points per coin, and blue is in second place, so that'll give them one point per coin. And then here, red and us are actually tied. We have three, and they have three. So it's friendly. Each one of us is effectively in first place, so that means red gets two more points per coin, and we will get two points per coin. So total, red is going to get five points per coin. We will get two points, and blue will get one point each. Well, blue has just three coins, so that's going to get them three more points. We have six coins, so six times two will get us 12 more points. And then the red player over here has 12 coins, and 12 times 5 is going to be 60, which is again the maximum you can score for the coins, as well as over here for the gears. So they definitely planned for this and leaned hard into it. That's going to bring them from 47 all the way up to 107 points. Next up, we can score for the crate majorities. I've discussed this a decent amount already. As you can see, the blue player has five tokens to our four up here, so they get four points per crate and we get one. And then down here, the red player has five tokens to our four. So the red player is going to get three points per crate and we get one. So even though we put the most tokens over here, we get the least impact. And that is certainly one part of the game where we did not do very well. So all told, the blue player gets four points per crate, red gets three points per crate, and we get two points per crate. Blue ended the game with seven crates, so seven times four will get them 28 more points. So that'll bring them up to 136. Now we ended the game with 12 cargo, which is almost twice as many as the blue player, but we only get two bonus points for each of these. 12 times two is going to get us 24 points though, which will bring us up to 125. And then the red player ended with eight cargo, and eight times three is going to get them 24 more points. That's going to bring them from 107 up to 131. And then the final thing that we have to do is have every player lose 10 points for each debt they still have. Remember, you'd have debt if you did not have the coins in order to pay them back at an 8 to 1 rate. Now, fortunately, again, none of us have debts at this point, so none of us will lose points for them. And that means this is the final score. Blue wins with 136, red is shortly behind at 131, and we are in third at 125, and that completes a full three-player game of Watch. That's also going to bring this tutorial to a close, because I believe I've taught just about all of the rules to the game, and I hope you've enjoyed learning how to play Watch. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.